Uh, pretty good. Hi, Ryan. Well, let, do you guys know each other already, by the way? Uh, I've known John for a lot of years, but... Uh, I, I don't know Ryan. Don't think I don't I've ever spoken Ryan. to you. Oh, well, I'm yeah, no, I think against... we may have like that C two E tour at some point, but yeah, not. I'm 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 kind of the fresh face to this group. <laughs> <laughs> well, all good. I'm well, listen, not... if I if I could just introduce you all, you know, just for the the start of this, I was going to do it as a live stream, and then I thought mm -hmm. I'm going to bugger that up. You know, the nice thing about doing it like this is we can cut in, we don't want to get out there or whatever, you know. But just to introduce everyone, we've got Ryan Seymour here from Comic Town in Ohio. How's it going? going? John Robinson. From Graham Crackers in Chicago with 13 stores, I think. Or is it? Yeah. Yep. Crazy. Phil Boyle, Coliseum of Comics in Florida with eight stores, Phil, yeah? Ten stores. Ten, what, since last week? You know? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Ten, ten stores. Uh, ten stores, two are, uh, are like franchises, and then we have our warehouse distribution operation. Amazing. Amazing. And. And I'm guessing most of you have been in the game. I mean, I know, John, you've been 1987. You know, you're all 20 years plus, yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. October 1st of 2000 for me. Well, I remember mm -hmm. I said online a few days ago, I was going to get three guys who really knew the business to come on and talk to because, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I don't mean to sound mean, but sometimes whenever you get opinions online, like columns and things by people, it's somebody who maybe runs a very small operation or a very recent operation. So they don't have the the perspective that somebody who's been in the business for a long time with a very right. broad range of stores in different areas mm -hmm. and everything's going to have. They can be great guys and they've got a great service, but they can't take the temperature the way you guys right. can. And mm -hmm. there is there's something so weird going on right now, isn't there? I mean, I I feel it. You know, like I mean, over the last few years, I've been looking at all this stuff. You know, because I read all the the comic media sites like everybody else. And all I see is comics is booming, blah, blah, blah. Everything's amazing. And you see that ICV2 graph, you know, where it showed you 20, 2020, 2021, 2022, and doubling in sales, right? I've got a lot of friends who've got comic shops, right? I've been hanging around comic shops for 40 years. Some of my best friends are retailers, and every one of them is struggling. Like every one of them is struggling. Right? Mm -hmm. And that some of them are closing, you know? I mean, great friends of mine are, are losing their stores. And it just didn't add up, right? And And... Oh, I couldn't it figure depends out. on what they're putting in on that. They're including Dogman, which has starting print months, runs of five million. Yeah. They're including every manga out there. But when you look at Marvel and DC periodicals, yeah, they're they're not making up a significant portion of yeah. anything right now. Which which is what the direct market comic store sells, isn't it? I mean, you're not in the Dogman business. You're not in the manga business, right. really. You know, because. Because most people who buy manga don't go to a comic store to buy it. You know, they, we they sell a lot of it. We sell an awful lot of it, actually. Uh, we sell Dogman. We sell uh, everything from Sonic and those types of books, uh, Sailor Moon. We sell a lot of the manga. We sell Chainsaw Man and Demon Slayer and Attack on Titan and everything else. And we order those, you know, literally we bought them by the hundreds when the, when the next issue comes out. But I, I feel as if the co American comics industry was being gaslit into thinking everything was going brilliantly. When what it was was happening was there was excellent, the best of the Japanese stuff, you know, that was coming over. Um, and that's not the same as having a healthy homegrown market, you know, because thousands of people are employed by the American comic book industry. And it's teetering, you know, it's absolutely teetering. And Phil, I, I don't know if you could maybe fill people in for anyone who missed, you know, something that really kicked all this off about three weeks ago when you wrote your article for ICV2 where you just said, look, you know, all is not great here, you know, like 2024 is going to have some challenges. Could you could you recap that for everyone? Well, some of the things I'm looking at is, um, uh, to give you a quick idea without boring everybody with a lot of numbers and details, uh, our DC sales from 2022 to 2023 have dropped 14%. Marvel has dropped 8%. That may not sound terrible, but... If we take out the ratio variance, which means the actual comics people are reading, DC is down 17% across my chain. Marvel is down 24%. Wow. Boom is boom is down 73%. Are you serious? Wow. So we've had an we've had an awful lot of uh of downturns. We've had a lot of people who are just uh tired of the fact there doesn't seem to be a lot of editorial oversight. Uh, there's there's a lot of retailers that have worked for 
damn near minimum wage for an awful lot of years because of the passion of what they loved. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's being gutted. And as I've put out there before, where else could you get 2,000 people across America and more across the rest of the, of the world who are willing to work for minimum wage 50 and 60 hours a week to promote your product? If you had to put that, you know, oh, and they'll pay you to do it. <laughs> uh, so, so if you had to actually hire that kind of marketing team, it'd cost you millions. But these publishers, they treat us like a cash cow. Well, Phil, can I ask what percentage is new comics in your store's makeup? Like how much impact is 14% of that department? You know, it, it, it varies between uh, between our locations, but it goes anywhere between about uh, 16 and 22%. We diversified an awful lot into back issues. Uh, we sell a lot of pops. We sell like literally pallets at a time. We sell a lot of games, a lot of CCGs. Uh, we've sold statues. We've sold figures. We've we've sold pretty much everything ancillary to the comic industry. Sure. So then those drops are pretty ancillary. For it's a small percentage of your actual sales. It doesn't have that much impact, right? What's that? The pops? The new comics. When it's Com new comics. Well, I don't think any of us wants to, you know, uh, slice 18 or 22 percent out of our sales. You know, that's we already have done that over the last couple of years and it's been very uncomfortable. And I think that we can seriously bring some of that back. But I, I just don't want it to slip anymore. I'd like to see it back in that 28, 29 percentile that it was only three years ago. But 10 years ago, could you have foreseen this, the idea you'd be for every business to be profitable, you're having to diversify into toys and things you're maybe not that interested in because you didn't get into this game to sell Funko Pops. You grew up reading great comic books, didn't you? That's correct. Yeah, and I've kind of seen the writing on this wall for quite a while. I've uh, written and been vilified for multiple uh, op-eds that I've written. I've been told you don't know what you're talking about. And Maybe I'm not you know, the smartest guy in any given room, but at the same time, I've been in this industry for over 40 years mm. and I see the trends. I see where it's going. And this, as I put in the ICV2 article, was it was no more of a surprise to anybody who had two brain cells and a list of back issues that they still needed. It wasn't a surprise to any of us. Here's my big question for you, right? Because did you guys catch the Glenn O'Leary interview I did last week? You know, the, the big thing that went on with Glenn, the, yes. the guy from Comics Palace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Glenn, Glenn <laughs> made, sorry, I picked up some virus at the weekend. We had our Christmas party on Saturday night and there was 95 people. One of them definitely had COVID, I'm sure. I've been coughing ever since. Um, Glenn O'Leary, he and I chatted <laughs> and he said, oh, sorry, he said the most modest criticisms of the current comic book industry and he was piled upon, he was wailed on for days and humiliated and so on. Why do you think it's provoking this kind of reaction? Because it looks to me, Phil, even from this far away, that you got something similar. You know, I feel as if as soon as you put the article up, where you were just spouting facts, right? You weren't, it wasn't an opinion column. This was just numbers, really, you know? Why do you think people went for you the way they did? You can uh, give 10 bullet points and nine of them can be strictly, here's the numbers, here's the numbers, here's the numbers. And as soon as you touch on anything, that may be a social issue or anything else, that's what that's what it all becomes about. And we don't want that. Uh, we want people having discussions about the actual industry yeah. and the things that are impacting it. And, you know, I believe there's a lot of factors at play here, and I really don't want to get into all the social issues today mm. uh, because we've had diversity in comics forever, and I'd like yep. to stay there. But at the same time, Marvel and DC in particular are very big tents, right? Marvel could publish everything they want to publish, and they can also publish things like Punisher, who's not some kind of watered-down version. They yeah. can they can publish everything. DC did it with Vertigo for a lot of years. Uh, at the same time, they were doing Powerpuff Girls over on the side, you know? So yeah. Yeah. big tents, everything can fit under those tents. And if it sells, let it sell. And do you, do you think it's the Disneyfication of Marvel? Do you think that's maybe the issue here? Because 
One thing that's always stayed with me is 1968 DC got bought by what well, eventually became Warner Brothers. And mm. there was a period of, I don't know, kind of pretty lackluster comics for about a decade. You had the DC implosion towards the end of that decade. Mm -hmm. And it, it felt as if they almost took time to reassert who they were. They were scared of their corporate owners and everything. And then they got their identity back by the time Dick Giordano came in around about 1981. Right. And then they had their best decade ever once they realized, hang on, we can do cool stuff. This is fine, you know? Do you think Marvel's maybe in that place just now where they're just a little, they're trying not to get fired maybe? I think a lot of people in this industry are just worried about their job. Yeah. And that's it. And that's part of the problem. And I, I understand where they're coming from. They got a family, they got kids. The last thing they want to do is take a chance with some of the things that Phil put in his article that he recommended they do puts their jobs on the line because they're long-term plans. It's not going to instantly show a profit. Yeah. Dropping seven more covers on a book is going to show a profit. And then their bosses are going to say, nicely done. You made more money this quarter than you did last quarter. So they're, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place as well as most of us. It's the downside, I guess, of being owned by someone else, isn't it? Who maybe doesn't the publishing yeah. at heart, you know? But I mean, do you guys, <laughs> John and Ryan, does this chime with you? You know, what, what Phil's saying, does this feel familiar to you? Oh, very much so, yeah. Uh, it's one, our drop, similar number-wise, uh, for, the, for the big two. Uh, what we're also experiencing too, and I don't know if, if, if Phil, you've noticed this too, but on the gaming side, those numbers have been depressed as well with Magic the Gathering, putting out so much product kind of like you know a, you know a new book having 15 different covers and no substance to it uh so it's it yeah it, it's 100 percent. we're experiencing that as well mm -hmm. yeah we we don't have a lot of safe refuges to run to right now because uh new comics are down uh we're seeing that all the things and things like magic the gathering and things like that are now available uh being distributed on amazon the day they come out at four dollars over our cost Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that when games were down, comics were up. When comics were down, games yep. were up. And right mm -hmm. now, it seems like there's a, a depression coming in on all of these items. So we have we have had things like Funko to buoy it. But I think Joe Field said, I sell Funko, but I didn't get into the comic book industry to sell Funko. But that's exactly what many of us are doing just to survive at this point. And... I've got a staff of uh, 62 people. There's a lot of people who really want us to keep our doors open. So we're <laughs> doing everything we can to do that. And, and we also, we've, go ahead. It's also the profit margins on the items. Uh, on, on comics, our percentage off from distribution has dropped by quite a bit. Uh, and other products like Funko, we don't get a great profit margin on, or at least not compared to other retail. Uh, stuff so those safe refuges are it's getting harder and harder to keep your fingers in the in the in the rock face while you're climbing i've seen a lot of people the last week or two since phil's article they've been really weird about it right online where they've said burn it all down you know we can build a better industry you know like that we need something new you know who cares if this goes and correct me if i'm wrong but do you not think we have the most amazing ecosystem that's emerged over the last century you know where you have four decades of newsstands giving way to the direct market, where, like you say, you have these ambassadors for comics in every comic store. Very much. Who understand it and, and have a brand loyalty with customers. And away Funko Pop never does. You know, like those Wednesday Warriors mm -hmm. are an amazing, reliable business, aren't they? That you can't yep, take yep. for granted. I, Absolutely. I, I think part of the inherent problem here, and I don't see this being spoken about, and you may not like hearing this either, Mark. But we need consistent long-term runs and books. Mm -hmm. We need people that stick with the title, and I need publishers to stick with the title. Publishers don't realize how much time it takes to sell a single customer on signing up for a four-issue miniseries. Mm -hmm. And that's going to translate to me making $8. And if I can convince somebody to buy a series, if Marvel or DC would continue to publish them consistently and not relaunch every year, if I can convince somebody to buy, say, Amazing Spider-Man or Daredevil or Batman or whatever, they'll stick through that title just out of habit, even when a, a bad writer or someone they don't care for takes over that book. Yeah, And they'll true. say, you know what, it's not very good, but I got all the other issues. But when these publishers constantly relaunch, sometimes twice in a year, I, I, I don't have the time to convince everyone. I know they stopped it. I know it's not the same creative team. Please sign up for this again. 
and I'm just losing slivers and slivers. I'm getting killed by a million paper cuts every single week, losing these customers because publishers will not stick with it. I used to have titles even during the 90s boom when stuff wasn't that great. And Marvel was just publishing stuff. At least there were 70 issues of Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. And the guy that signed up for number one was with me for another six years. I, I, I don't get that anymore. It's constantly stopped and they stop. You know, there the used to be a spike with the number one though, wasn't there? You know, like what we used to do was something like Kick-Ass, for example, we would do yeah. a new number one for every arc. So you'd get this massive spike and then it would slowly tail down. So you you had you know an artificial income coming in on it. You know, it was good. But, but I think that's gone now. I don't think people fall for that oh, anymore. Yeah. Don't they? It's yeah, diminishing it's returns. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. every time you'd relaunch, you get a little less than the last relaunch. Yeah. Yeah. Every number one is a jumping on, but every final issue before that has a jumping off. And mm -hmm. the jumping on is never equivalent to the jumping off. That's and amazing. it's always diminishing returns. I, decades of doing this, I've never seen a point where the sixth issue of the previous series is lower than the sixth issue of the most recent series. It is continually dropping yeah. every single series. With, with the there's always exceptions of course jason aaron's takes over a title and suddenly you get more readers and sure there's always exceptions but that's again that's the exception to the rule phil's absolutely mm -hmm. right it just keeps dropping you're giving people a reason to stop collecting which just kills me and what walking dead and saga i guess are two good examples of that as well consistent same team month after month yeah year after year but yeah. the problem again now go ahead phil no one cover they did it yeah. with yeah. one cover for a decade. You know, it was mm -hmm. it's amazing. And it was one of the top selling comics. Mm -hmm. They did it at $2.99 for a long time, one of the top selling comics. And I don't think anybody regrets how that was published. Yeah. And but I don't know about Phil and Ryan. Are you guys seeing a huge drop with Saga since they took these massive breaks and we lost like 40% of the women that were buying that title because they got tired of waiting? I used yeah. to order the new trade and get hundreds. And now yeah. it's like a fraction of that because they all these creators think, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go try video games. I'm going to try TV. My fans will be there when I come back. And they're not. The fans yeah. move on. They, yeah, they numbers, do move on. Very yeah, short. numbers are down. Battle Chasers is another one. Like Joe Mad yep. left video games. It comes back and it's 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 not the 100 plus juggernaut it used to be. By you know, that, that was a decade between, not just six months, yeah. but <laughs> even six months, yeah. people forget. People oh, yeah. absolutely forget. They move on to the next thing. And unfortunately, I think people are moving on to video games. They're moving on to Kindle. They're moving on to other things rather than an actual printed comic, you know, that they can hold in their hand. So, but don't you, Phil, do you not think that's a quality issue as well? Because I remember when I, I was in my 20s when I started at DC back in the 90s. I remember sitting at lunches and... I must have sounded so precocious, right? I was sitting there and all these guys were in their 40s. I was in my 20s. And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason sales are bad. This was about 1996 or something. So said, the reason sales are bad is because, you know, kids are into video games now. They're spending a lot of money on training shoes and all this kind of thing. And I said, you know, I think the books are just really bad, you know? And, and everybody... <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a quality issue. It has yeah. always been a quality issue. But with as many... As many monkeys at typewriters right now, we've got to be having some kind of Shakespeare. And there are some really great books out right now, but the signal to noise is extremely difficult to hear at this point. But is there enough though that I mean I, I, I'm fascinated by looking at it year out, uh, you know, years at a time. And I go back and sometimes look through these databases to see what was being published in January 1968, what was being published in February 1977. And when you look at especially mid 80s, you know, there's an exceptional amount of quality books with real consistency, like Claremont and Byrne. You know, I, I didn't read that stuff growing up, but I, I recognize it like Claremont and Byrne and so on, Frank Miller, Walt Simonson. You know, these are all coming out in the same month. And one of my yeah. friends made a good point and he says, people will not show up for one or two good books a month. They need like 20 good books a month. You know, you, do you think that's an issue right now that there's just not enough yeah. good stuff? I don't. Um... I remember unpacking the books, as I'm sure Phil does, in the 80s. And, you know, there were 15 books you'd put out on the rack. You'd have guys to come in to get their two books. I don't think they need 15 or 20. And budget-wise, I think as long as they get two good books a, a week, that they're happy. 
if they're the, really excited the, about those the, books. The industry needs that every every month. I mean, not not so much individual customers, but oh, I see a, a wide range of great books. You know, you there's an excitement about comics then because I remember when Dark Knight was coming out, Watchmen was coming out. And you almost didn't know what to talk about. It was like, and at the same time, Crisis and Infinite Earths was just wrapping up and everything. You know, it's there's a lot I, of cool stuff all happening at once, and that that's what creates your noise, doesn't it? I've uh, I've talked about before that I think one of the problems we have in the industry is there's no parking lot books. Mm -hmm. A parking lot book is something where somebody somebody buys the comic and they sit in their car and they have to read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John Burns X Men used to be that. Frank Miller's Daredevil used to be that. Walter Simonson's uh, Thor used to be that. Today, they're more likely to go out, pull the book out, and look at the app to see what the variant cover they just bought is worth this minute, rather wow. than what it was worth 10 minutes ago when they bought it. Yeah, We do have those parking lot books. And much like your comment, Mark, of start with a profit sharing, bring in some of these creators who have done comics for a very long time. They understand the process. They understand how to build a long-term cohesive story and give the profit sharing. At the same time, I'd like to see publishers not only do that, but also set thresholds and say, okay, retailers, everything above that, we're gonna sell you at cost so you can grow your market. It costs us more to put a book on the stands than it costs Marvel, DC, and Image, anybody else. Our cost is higher and we're the ones who who are then stuck with it if we can't sell it. Give us the books at a reasonable rate over a specific rate, and we can stock our stands. People can come in; they can find things again. Right now, and I'm going to jump. I want to jump into returnability off that, Bill. It, sure. It's stupid to give us 100% returnability. That's putting all the risk on your guys as the publishers. End 50% is the perfect for the first two issues when we're shooting in the dark and we have no idea our customer is going to try this book if we think we can sell eight we'll probably order 16 because you guys are taking 50 percent of the risk as well this way you don't have anybody abusing it and taking 100 copies and returning 97 of them just to get threshold books that's the other thing never do thresholds when you're doing returnability hmm. it, it makes the two worthless it, it counteracts each other and the publishers never ask us about this stuff and they just plow ahead going forward but 50% returnability, no one can abuse the system. We're both taking equal risk. Everybody wins because we have more copies on our rack and you guys get more exposure. Do you feel the publishers lack respect for the retailers? Yes. Yeah. And I don't blame them. <laughs> I think I, I've I think... been to retailer meetings. It's embarrassing. Yeah. I've seen guys stand up and complain about, you guys use the color purple too much. My customers don't like the color purple. And they got to keep a straight face and not make fun of these retailers and be like, oh, yeah, we're going to take that into consideration. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you're well, I understand. Because right <laughs> yep. right, you're at, at, the same time, at the same time, all retailers, and I do everything I can to support the retail community. I run a retailer page. We do FOC notes on a weekly basis. We do speculator notes. We have an open forum of discussing things, things that I'm doing in my operation that we share with others. So I'm doing everything I can to help grow the community, the retail mm -hmm. community. But at the same time, the, the guy who's ordering six copies of Batman has the same online voice as the guys who's ordering 400 every month. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's uh, everybody's equal on the Internet. And I think there are some some good things to everybody having a voice. But at the same time, when it comes down to business and numbers, we need to start looking at what's moving the needle, what's really putting the books in the stores, what's yeah. really selling comics. Because my friends in retail all across different countries all seem to have the same issue right now, which is they're getting books they can't sell, they feel. They feel like... They're trying, they, they want to sell these books, but the, the, the product that they're getting isn't the stuff their their customers want. Um, is this a thing you think is broadly the case? And why do you think publishers aren't listening to you when you say this to them? Because this must be a very common thing you're saying to them. What we're commonly saying is there's too many books and no one publisher can control that. Everyone could cut back a little. But again, everyone's afraid of letting the other guy take market share. So I understand the position they're in. The retailers themselves have to put their foot down and, you know, I never like to admit it. Phil does a better job at this than I do. 
I visited his stores and he'll have hardly any independent small press, tiny books to take a chance on because he's taken all the chance. And so many of us retailers, myself included, operate under fear of missing out. Like if I, if I don't have this new scout title or if I don't have this one on my rack, even if it's just one or two, I got to have it or they're going to drive down the street and try the other guy. So then suddenly you got 2000 retailers buying a book. There's zero demand for <laughs> just, just, just yeah. to have it on the road. Yeah. yeah. Well, That's we made exactly. a decision some years ago that anything that was selling less than 10 copies of uh, as a chain, we were not going to rack them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, That's one copy of store. How can I afford to rack that and hope to sell that? The best I'm going to do is break even on that on a monthly basis. It's taking up space. It takes up time. Uh, it's just, I, I can't do that, especially when a lot of times we're shipping, we're getting 35 or 40% discount. And that just, that's just untenable. It just does not work long-term for any kind of sustainability. So, And again, yeah, and going back to what Phil said about the direct market potentially disappearing inside the next couple of years, you know, like, uh, again, it's naivety on the part of the people online, but I see a lot of people saying, oh, it'd be awesome to lose Marvel and DC. You know, who cares? That means then all the creators can just come forth and be themselves and blah, 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 you know? But it's like, as much as I'm a massive advocate of the indie scene, do you guys agree that without Marvel and DC, there is no indie scene? Like, you've nowhere to sell your books? Oh, they're the anchors. Like, if weeks where there's really low Marvel uh, titles or really low DC titles there's also a significant drop. Like people are coming in for your Superman, their Batman, their, their Avengers. Uh, like it, it's great when guests are less likely to take a chance on a book that isn't a big publisher and, and, and doesn't have big creators on it. So yeah, no, we need those big two. We do. Yeah. Unfortunately I, I, I do. Um, we need that foot traffic that they bring in, but it's also, you know, guys like yourself that have worked at those two, it's so much easier to sell your books because of it. And I got a quick question for you because I never heard. I appreciate your experiment with the nightclub, which was a great miniseries. And you took a chance and priced it at $1.99. And I use that as a selling point. You guys are all crying. They're too expensive. They're too expensive. I'm like, you got an A-list creator. You got a great artist. It's a buck ninety nine. Did it work out? Was it? Uh, we, we actually did roughly double what we would normally do, you know? Um, and I was like, excellent. And then paper costs went up so high. <laughs> paper costs went from, <laughs> the cost of putting the book together went from like 12 cents to about 72 cents or something, you know, and I was like, oh, great, you know. So we didn't lose money, but it, if we'd done it three years ago, it would have made a lot more money, you know, when paper was a little bit cheaper. Um, but it did roughly double sales, you know, maybe maybe 80% up or something, you know. But was that your expectation? paper cost made it prohibitive, so I wouldn't do it again. You know, was okay. that your expectation to double it or did you were you hoping I, for a triple or I didn't know actually, you know, I didn't know, but <laughs> I am I am fascinated by price because one thing you guys are much more expert in this than I am, but our babysitter was here a couple of weeks ago, right? And she was watching the kids and we gave her the money for looking after the kids that night and she got 50 pounds, right? Um, because we were out for quite a long time, and she got 50 pounds and she went to she says, I'm I'm gonna buy two bottles of an energy drink tomorrow. And I was like, what? And she told me there was this 25 pounds, you know, which is like 30 bucks energy drink called Prime, right? And and she says, uh, oh, it's, it's amazing. And and I was like, can you not get an energy drink for like a dollar kind of thing, you know, like a pound? And she was like, yeah, yeah, but this is the one everybody wants right now, you know? And I realized if somebody really wants something, they will pay for it, you know? So sometimes if you drop the price too much, it doesn't really matter that people are going to buy it anyway. I like to keep things as cheap as possible, but do you find price as uh, a factor? <laughs> I, I have a strong opinion on this one. I don't think price is as important as people think to a limit. Obviously, you can't charge $28 or 25 pounds for a comic book and get away with it unless it's a giant collected book. There is a ceiling, and I think it's important that we all reflect that ceiling, but there's also mistakes made. I, I, I'll actually ask Ryan and Phil if they agree. If Spawn was $3.99 instead of $2.99, would you not still sell the same quantity? And yeah, most customers would. wouldn't even notice. Yeah. That's yep. that's been an ongoing thing. Is are we leaving a dollar a month on the on the table? Right. And I'd say the answer is yes. I think three ninety nine is a fine price, but when we start seeing uh, first issues come out at six ninety nine, that is a barrier to entry. And as we all know, number two has a significant drop from number one. So if number one is already stymied by the price point, 
is all you're doing is shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, especially if it's a relaunch, which is a, a jumping off point. So now you've increased the price to get somebody to come back in. Yeah, not not good. <laughs> not smart. But, so, but yes, uh, 999, uh, when you start hitting that price point, people are just looking at going, that's that's too much. It's just simply too much for a lot of people. So, And what do you think was the turning point? Because um, we all feel something's changed, you know, and it was probably, a, for me, I would say around 2016, a turning point in people's enthusiasm. Because I don't know what you guys are reading yourselves compared to what you were reading 10 years ago. You know, but I went from reading maybe 20 books a month down to maybe one, you know, and a lot of my friends have just stopped reading altogether. They would t buy piles of stuff that just piled up in the house and then they canceled their orders and so on. You know, what what do you guys think was the the year that happened for people? The year, I don't know if I can put a finger on the year, but we started seeing editorial changes uh, at Marvel probably six or eight years ago that it really, really took a, a definite lack of editorial direction in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And DC, you know, people love to hate on Dan DiDio and they hate to love him and all this kind of stuff. But at least it seemed like he had a cohesive publishing plan. Mm -hmm. Didn't always work the way he wanted it to. But at the same time, at least, at least there was a plan. Yeah. And one of the challenges have been how many people at Marvel or DC who work there have a little list in their wallet or on their phone of the back issues they're looking for. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you it is a 2% of what it was 20 years ago. But think of this. Fans. Yeah. But Phil, that, that time period you're talking about is when Marvel in particular as a brand and even DC in global terms, was the biggest that's ever been in its history. I mean, you could sell anything with the Marvel brand on it. I would see bald 55-year-old men walking around in Marvel t-shirts, you know, like it was easy yeah, yeah. to Marvel to anyone, you know. Why the hell could nobody sell Marvel comics between 2016 and 2020 when it was at its hottest, when the movies were making Comedy. two and two billion? The, the drop-off I felt for us uh, as a chain was when we lost all the top-tier creators to Hollywood pitches. Yeah. I was getting people I'd never seen coming in for Saga every month. They were coming in for Sex Criminals. They were coming in. Image was on fire. They were yeah. hiring all these people and then brought new people in, and everyone was excited. I can't wait for the next one. Then all those creators got attention of Hollywood and said, bye-bye. And those books just dried up. And then... Uh -huh. It was, yeah, and that's where we saw the big drop. But I think 2016, 2017 is fair. After yeah. the initial New 52 excitement and boom, mm -hmm. and the 2010s were fantastic. You were doing books. A Fraction was doing books, at the mainstream guys, and people were excited. And we lost all those creators. I And I, I always worry about old man syndrome. I'm in my mid-50s, and I don't want to be the guy that's always, you know. I, I, I dealt with those when I was a kid going into comic stores and you dealt with these guys. Ah, oh, the 40s were a good time. And I'm like, these <laughs> comics are unreadable. Like, it's just like <laughs> children wrote these. They're terrible. <laughs> so I, I try to make sure I'm not becoming that. But I look at the, the creators at these A-list companies. I'm like, I don't know these guys. I, I, I You know, and there, there almost seems to be homogenous house style again at DC and Marvel. Instead of having the superstar artists working on these books, they've all moved off to do their own projects. Can I just say so the, nothing... only, oh, sorry, the, the only way you can tell you're getting old is if your criticisms aren't sort of like uh, in line with the numbers. So that when the numbers are cratering and you're hating it, you're right. It's nothing to do with age, you know? So if the numbers are doing gangbusters like the early 90s and you're saying this is all garbage, you're getting old, you know? But yeah, like, the numbers are slipping, so you're correct. You know. Yeah, I, I got one of the old man yells at clouds memes sent to me uh <laughs> over my last thing, and it's like <laughs> I'm sorry, the numbers are there. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you like what I'm saying, you can refute how I said it. You cannot refute the fact the numbers are down. The publishers know it, the retailer know retailers know it. The only ones who are still propping this up, you know, or some of the editors here and there who are saying, oh, no, everything is fine, as you know, Rome is burning, so. Is it because they don't want to admit they were wrong? Which I think you have to do in business sometimes because you take yeah. a risk. 
Sometimes it doesn't work and then you have to course correct and do something else, don't you? But do you think that's what it is? Do you think they're a bit scared to say, oh my God, we've gone, we've taken a very wrong turn here? Well, Again, things- I, I'm afraid they're afraid of losing their jobs mm-hmm. or being yes. the guy to blame. So why ever publicly say that? You know, why ever take the blame and say, we tried this, it didn't work, it was a mistake. And, you know, all the fans didn't understand. You know, it's better to blame the fans or the readers than to blame yourself if you're worried about your job. And in the way, I mean, I know millions of retailers, right? But you must know even more than me. What's the chatter among other retailers across America? You know, what's the that kind of underground whisper? Are, are they disappointed in what they're being given to sell? There, It's very tough selling some of the books today. Uh, one of the questions I always ask, and I do not do my own new book ordering anymore. I do go over the numbers. But uh, I have a guy who's younger than I am going over it. I mm-hmm. uh, And... Part of it is always, who are we going to sell this to? Mm -hmm. And that's every product we carry. Who's going to buy this? Uh, It's a new book. Uh, You know, it's a Mark Millar book. We know the same people who bought your last project are going to be interested in this project. Mm -hmm. The problem is, here's two creators we've never heard of. Here's (laughs) uh, a book that's been rebooted with a completely different character. Who are we going to sell that to? Because it's not an apples to oranges or an apples to apples comparison there. So we're kind of uh, guessing on so many of these books right now. So is that your solution? I mean, you guys are on the absolute front lines. I see so many opinions, but it's people who think about comics for five minutes every day. You're thinking about them 24 hours every day, right? Like, is your solution to get A-list creators? You know, that, that would be a game changer. If Marvel and DC splashed the cash and got really high in talent absolutely yeah i I, i'd like to hear what ryan thinks but absolutely yeah jim lee could draw the phone book and and it would sell uh Mm -hmm. like we don't have as much as i love up and coming creators being being brought to like you know being put on books those big rock star names aren't like they're not doing stuff anymore Mm -hmm. and those automatically pull people back in laps readers will come back for a book um yeah, I mean, we it it we need them. Like we just, it really helps us put books into people's hands. I mean, the thing what a lot of people don't understand <clears throat> is if you do a creator own book, you know, even optioning it can be like what you get paid. I mean, me and Bendis were the two highest paid guys at Marvel when we were at Marvel, and two movie options, just two options for eighteen months, was our salary at Marvel. You know, so I mean, for a four issue miniseries that then carries on for the next thing, you know, so the money in Hollywood is insane, you know, compared to, yeah. to comics. Do you think as well as addressing the relationship with the retailer and coming up with new thresholds and so on, it is time to lure everybody back with a proper royalty deal. If they can't afford the upfront money to give some crazy back end. I'm going to say yes off the bat on that, but Mark, you could probably answer this better than anyone else. If you were being paid to, to develop a new script for a series, you'd expect to make X amount of money. Mm-hmm. But Marvel and DC will take the script that you wrote for them and pay you a fraction of that. Mm-hmm. They're going to take that script and make it into a movie or a TV series and then maybe pay you more on the other end. Yeah, Marvel and DC should not be treated as publishing companies that have to make a profit. They should be treated as R&D companies for these multi-billion dollar franchises, put some money up front, make this stuff good because the stuff that's coming out now, it's not going to be movie worthy. It's not going to be TV series worthy. And we've seen some of the stuff as we've run out of some of the some of the key storylines that happened in Marvel Comics. And now we see that we're getting into very secondary characters and everything. And they're just not moving those movie needles like Disney would like them to. I mean, so they should be putting the money up front, not on a back end. Working in a studio has taught me something that I didn't appreciate when I was outside the studio, which is that Hollywood really needs source material. It sounds crazy, right? You don't think, you think, oh, screenwriters can come up with stuff, but they can't. They can't. Think of any Spider-Man movie or anything, you know, that isn't based on some Stan Lee comic or whatever, you know, there's a pit. The scene you remember is the scene from the Stan Lee comic and so on, you know. There's a right. something there's some integrity to the dna that just makes it work and it's the same with novels and everything too when they do original screenplays they're so few and far between and they certainly aren't the ones that become big massive franchises and i think you're right because endgame was the end of marvel cinematically and then what they've had to feed on since then is all the sort of less good comics haven't they i mean 
they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel now in terms of stuff that they can adapt. So for their own sake, you know, if they if they invested in the the print side of things, they could be making billions of dollars on, on the other end. Well, if you if you really want to put a finer point on that, uh, I put this question to a few people. Name five Marvel and five DC trade paperbacks that are must reads that have come out in the last five years. I can't name, name two. Can't name two. Yeah. Yeah. There's nice House there's, on the Lake. <laughs> okay. And and you could say, uh, you know, uh, Batman White Knight. There's a few things that we can really recommend, but for the most part, they're just not there. The the storylines are not there. It seems to be who can we introduce a new character that might get pigeonholed into something and we can make, you know, bank on that. Mm -hmm. If there is no editorial direction. And what about the number of comics? Because I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that I was looking quite recently, I was looking back at the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and the number of books that DC was bringing out in a particular month was staggering. You know, I couldn't believe it. There was almost nothing. Like the the flash was like a quarterly or something, you know, Green Lanterns bi-monthly, you know. So these books, they they'd hardly anything out there. Like Superman had two titles a month because it was selling a million copies, you know. So like you must feel there's too many books just now. You know, when you look at a shrunken depressed market to be bringing out the same number of books you had in the boom of 15 years ago just does it seem mad to you guys it seems crazy to me absolutely it's, yeah yeah it's quant it's quantity over quality at this point and in, in my opinion and what i don't understand is how are these publishers staying in business i'm like we're one of the largest comic chains out there and i order next to nothing on these small press books mm -hmm. and i sell next to nothing on the small press books and get stuck with a lot even I'm like, I don't see the numbers adding up to keep themselves in business. I don't know if they're all taking their inheritance and living their dream or if they've got backers that think this is all going to pay off at some point. I think that's a big part of it. I mean, from what I understand, there's a lot of private equity cash has gone into these things in the hope they can flip it and do what we did with Mellow World and sell it to a big, bigger company. You yeah. know? And they're hoping if they stick 50 million in something, then they get 500 million when they sell the company. You know, so, so I, but that's, I mean, that's, the big mistake people make, I think, in business generally is to think what happens five, ten years ago works in this particular period. We were we sold Mellow World at the perfect time when Marvel was absolutely on the ascendant. So the studios were looking for the next Marvel. Whereas right now Marvel's hitting the rocks, you know. So trying to sell a comic book company just now, I think, would be very difficult. Yeah, the difference is you had a proven track record. You've gotten your properties, yeah. your ideas turned into films. Yeah. These other guys are they're, they're just swinging for the fences. It's odd, but you know. That's, you... that's what new creators do, though. You know, yeah. I, can't, I can't fault them for that because everybody started somewhere. Yeah. And even some of the most classic creators who we've talked about here, uh, some of their earliest artwork was in fanzines and everything else. So I can't fault that. You know, an image took a lot of gainers on some of these guys who had never been heard of. And all of a sudden, they're superstars writing X Men and everything else. Mm -hmm. So. I don't think that's a bad thing, but at the same time, it used to be easier to support that when our cost of entry on those books was so much lower. Yeah. And now there's more books. Marvel is sucking all the all the air out of the wallets right now with all their variants and everything else. And anyone who thinks that's not a very deliberate marketing pl marketing plan is fooling themselves. Oh, it 100 percent is. Like when when uh you'll have a book that'll have five, 10 covers each issue with Marvel until the last two or three issues. And it's one cover. We don't know how many we need of that one cover. Like how many people are actually reading it versus how many people are buying one of every Scotty Young cover. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's gotta be intentional. Here's a question. Yeah, publisher... people, gonna, people will kill me for this question, right? They'll hate this as retailers. What would you rather a big name creator did his own creator own projects or a big, big book at Marvel or DC? It's easy. They both, both have Marvel. their merits. <laughs> What's that? Um, they both have their merits, but the fact is, if Marvel has a massive hit, like when they did uh, House of X, Power of X, it brought fans in. They mm -hmm. came in for X-Men. They came in for a great story. Fans were talking about it. And without a strong Marvel, without a strong DC, we don't get a strong image. We don't get a strong boom. Not in comic stores. And we need that. We absolutely need that. Mm -hmm. 
Because I feel, I mentioned this on Twitter a few weeks ago and everybody went crazy. But I said, like, although we work in the independent scene, um, we kind of, one, owe it to where we came from, but two, to keep the independent scene afloat, everybody needs to go back and do one project, at least at Marvel or DC, you know, to help boost everything up again. And then your, and you get- your, books, your books are going to be helped by this, you know, down the line, because the shops are going to be healthier and making more money. Would you say that's a good plan? That everybody- Absolutely. It raises wanted- your profile being on these high profile books. So then people remember that creator and we're then able to cross sell, which is what it's all about. The only reason I'm carrying this new Zorro book is because of the creator. <laughs> Normally, if it said Zorro, I just go skip. <laughs> Nobody cares about that yep. character and I move on. But, so but yeah, that, that his his white knight raised his profile and now we're going to carry Zorro in the story. But for, for you guys as well, though, you know, like, do you feel like everybody coming back and doing a big Marvel DC project is going to be great for the stores that are maybe hanging by a thread? Yes, but it can't be just a four issue limited series. Right. They have to take it on for a year or like Hickman did, take yeah. it on for an extended period so it draws people in, keeps them into the story for a while and isn't just hand over. As soon as Hickman was off that, yeah, Marvel splintered it into what sixty eight titles or whatever, and nothing <laughs> sold anymore. You know, and it's like, yeah. oh, this is a good thing. Let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, get the printing press going, and off we go. And next thing you know, nobody wants to follow any of it, and they had a real, real winner on their hands. <laughs> that yeah, felt they- like Marvel's last really good storyline, the Hickman X Men. Like that felt like the last time it was a proper event. You know, and what would you say? What were the numbers like for that compared to? typically X-Men doing at the moment? Is it much of a difference? Because we don't eventually hire. Yeah, it was like Avengers versus X-Men days or Civil War days where people wanted it and they returned to the comic store because they heard about it. Yeah. Wow. And it's it's dropped considerably since then? Oh yeah, we're down to about 20, 25% of it. Unfortunately. You're doing 25% of what that was doing? Yeah, X-Men... Yeah, their run was so amazing. And yeah. as people, even the casual readers that weren't really following it for Hickman, right. as they noticed that quality difference, that 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 long term planning of the story difference, they just dropped like, it, you know, it, it just didn't work for him anymore. But that says everything about how important the creator is, then, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 If the, if the, if the creator is not bringing quality, mm-hmm. people won't buy it anymore. They're, they're not willing to take a risk especially if they know it's only going to be like a six issue mini series. Yeah. There's, there's no, no reason for them to invest in it for long-term purposes. And what about back issues? I mean, are you guys, um, are you aware of what your percentages are in terms of like back issues to regular new comics and everything? Have you seen that increase over the last few years or? Yes. Yeah. I, I put yeah. together a chart for you for 2013 versus 2023, the 10 year difference. Oh, wow. You want me to send that over? <laughs> do you want me to screen share it? I can show if you. you. Can, uh, if, you, if, you, if you know how to do that, that'd be amazing. Send it or screen share? Uh, well, if you can do it, that'd be great because I have no idea. Screen share has been disabled. So if you're not familiar, oh. <laughs> then, then I cannot <laughs> screen share. I will, uh, I'll send it over to you. And, <laughs> okay. You know. So what, what, what's the rough, the rough uh, percentages, though? What would you say? It's going to be different for all of our stores, but yeah, I'll send it over and then we'll let the other guys talk. Yeah, we we definitely, uh, our back issues have been up. The interest has been up. Now, granted, prices have been up, even though they've been going through a bit of a correction. Something can't mm-hmm. triple in price and stay there forever. But uh, we're seeing a lot of people where they used to buy new books. Now, instead, they're buying the back issues because uh, in many cases, the stories are better. The characters are more defined. And I think a lot of the artwork is better, but that's personal taste. So, mm-hmm. and the price, if you're going to spend $6 for a new book or $6 for a back issue, and we sell a lot of them less than that, yeah, it's a better deal. And what better age deal. are these guys who are buying the back issues? Is it older guys who reminisce or is it younger guys who want to get in on this? A mix of both. A mix of yeah, both, actually. Uh, yeah. Like there's definitely people coming in uh, that, especially coming out of COVID, there was like this I don't know, nostalgia kind of thing and people started coming back and re- rebuilding what they had in the past. Mm-hmm. But there's also a lot of younger readers that are going through and they've heard about these iconic story arcs from the 80s and the 70s. And they're trying to track those books down. I, mm-hmm. So, I mean, it really for, for us, it, it's been been both. <laughs> That's yeah. really interesting. Here's, here's an interesting fact about I think Ryan and uh, Bill would both agree with me on is. 
DC trade paperbacks outsell Marvel trade paperbacks by a lot. Mm -hmm. um, they're collected stories. They seem to write the book, uh, comics for these formats, and they have a lot of hits. Our top 50 is always full of DC books. Marvel rarely makes it on there unless there's some kind of movie tie-in. But on the flip side, Marvel back issues sell double what DC back issues sell. It's the same material, yeah. but the collectors want it in the comic book form for Marvel. And if you think about it, a title like Spider-Man, it's been running since 62. How many great storylines or trades are there for Spider-Man? Three? Four? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. ridiculous. They they didn't write. They wrote it as a soap opera, and there wasn't really self-contained stories to collect there. I don't know. I'd, I'd argue if there's some uh, that the average just twelve issue run of anything in the seventies was better than a lot of the books they're coming out with now, hmm. just because there was really a cohesive storyline. It's funny because I grew up reading comics in the seventies, and I've always looked back and felt how fortunate I was to become a teenager in the eighties when comics came into their own because if they had stayed like they were in the 70s i would have quit yeah they, i mean they really grew the, the 80s brought it to a whole new level i, yeah. I do agree with that so do you know think is that music though and whatever you were into when you were a certain age is just your favorite thing as yeah well. yeah so, i mean yeah probably i probably. mean my favorite comics are like kurt swan superman comics nobody cares about that <laughs> except me you know but it's just because i read that when i was 12 you know i, I loved it it, it's ingrained in us at that point, yes. Yeah. But, yep. So. But um, do you think like, movies, you know, I'm, we'll wrap up soon, you know, because I know you guys have got proper jobs to get on with. I'm, I'm sitting about here. But, like, uh, yeah, the movies help comics, you know, because I always remember I was a teenager, but starting to break into the comics industry a bit. I was sneaking into parties when the DC guys were over in London in 1989 for Tim Burton's Batman. And I somehow blagged my way into a, a DC party with a free bar and everything. It was all really cool. And <laughs> what they were, everybody was all pouring champagne and everything about what the Batman comics were selling, like, because the anticipation of this movie really got people excited. And anything with Batman on it was selling. And it was funny, I was talking to Denny O'Neill and Denny O'Neill said to me, we actually feel so good about the way this is going. We're thinking of introducing a third Batman title. You know, it's a terrible risk, but we're <laughs> thinking about doing this, you know, and and but it felt like the movie was helping it in a way that do you think movies help help things now? I was selling a gross of t-shirts a week in yeah. 1989 when Batman really? came out. I couldn't get them fast enough. We were selling that much stuff that quickly. <laughs> but yeah, same here. I spent it all day processing t-shirts for people. Uh, anything with the bat symbol did sell. And I used to argue against the fact that movies helped the comics because. Every normal person you'd speak to that saw the Iron Man film or whatever film they really enjoyed, they'd all come to me like, you guys must be killing it now because everyone's watching these Marvel movies. And I'm like, well, what's the last comic you bought? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't buy those. But, we so, have, it, but Walking Dead, it works in Kick-Ass. I remember, I always, this is a fact that always stays with me. The seven weeks before the Kick-Ass movie came out, we sold 100,000 copies of the Kick-Ass hardcover oh. at $25 they, a pop, you know? They would uh, watch hardcover. Them, yes. So, but is it just that after 2010, there was just so much comic product out there in terms of cinemas and then television made it even worse, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, the, initially it, it was it was huge. Like we sold hundreds of copies of Watchmen when the Watchmen movie came out. Mm -hmm. Similar sort of thing with 300. Um, but with each year, it, it, like, it, it sold less and less and less and became very either key back issue or trade paperback for that story arc used for the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yep. All the sales come before the movie or the TV show is launched. We, mm -hmm. you know, we'll sell 90% of what we're going to sell based on that show or that movie in the four to six weeks leading up to it. After that, it's like, oh, been there, done that. We've seen that. We don't need to read it now. So, mm -hmm. but we sold a ton. I put some questions out online to some people when I said I was going to be doing this. And there's a couple of really interesting ones. One, somebody says here, if you knew what you knew now, would you have started working in comic retail? If you could go back in time? I felt 100%. Into it. It, yeah. I fell into I, it and I loved it. So, yes. That's, that's yeah. My life, good or bad, everything stems from the shop. So, yeah, no, I wouldn't trade a second of it for anything else. Yeah. Yes. I, I literally grew up with terrible comic book stores, grumpy old guys, you know, that 
And I'm like, I, I want there to be good comic shots that people look forward to and are treated nicely. And I didn't have that as a kid. And I wanted other kids to have that and other people to grow up and have that opportunity. So absolutely, I'd still do it. And to That's end the on passion a Marvel and DC is giving up right now. That's the passion they're giving up. They should yeah. invest in this part of the community. Why do you think why do you think there is that disconnect? <laughs> do you think it's the kind of people working at Marvel and DC don't have the same passion for the industry as the guys who were there 20 years ago? Nope. What do you think is the problem? I, I don't think they have a list of back issues that they need on their phones. I don't think <laughs> that they're invested into the history of the industry. And I don't think they're being particularly good stewards of the characters here 80 years in. Yeah, I think, and, and we have two separate goals. Like with, with comic retailers, we're trying to get good books into people's hands that they'll pick up every month after month after month and love. Mm -hmm. Over at the publishing side, once you get high enough up the food chain, they're just interested in numbers, mm -hmm. pushing paper. So unless they begin to understand what we're trying to do, it, we're not going to get that. It, it's not going to help. There, there, has to be, there has to be a meeting of the minds there between the two. It's not just about making great books that everyone you know, really, really wants. Everyone, no, one's, no one purposely makes a bad comic book. It's always everyone's yep. trying their best to make a great comic. So I try not to fault ones that I don't care for. But you got it has to make some money, just like we with our stores. It's the same problem we're stuck in. Mm -hmm. I can love eight billion genies or whatever current book as much as I do, but if I can't convince someone to buy it, it's stupid to buy fifty extra copies. Mm -hmm. It's it's somewhere in between there. We need someone working at DC and Marvel, or multiple people working at these publishers, and same with Image and Dark Horse and everywhere else that actually is passionate about this industry beyond a, an employee that feels like he's selling nuts and bolts and doesn't care about the product itself. Do you think on the industry side, there's a bit of a cesspit problem as well? You know, like, I mean, people say to me, why do you care so much? You know, because you're sort of out the industry in a lot of ways and everything, but it's, I've been into this since I was five. I can't remember not being into it, right? So I love it and I care that it exists and it's done well. I, I just It's just part of who I am, you know? But like, uh, you know, there is a, a bit of a weird thing. Like some pals of mine, when they left comics and went into film or television, they said, it's so good not having to deal with all that stress you know like people trashing me online and all this kind of thing you know yeah you, i mean for me meeting other comics people was the most exciting thing that ever happened to me i remember walking into a comic shop when i was 12 or 13 and thinking okay it's like it was like one of the mutants going to xavier's school i was like okay I'm, I'm here with my people now you know it's like i i understand this world here you know like do you, do you feel comics has lost a bit of that you know like the comic store is is no longer a hub for people to hang out or no, I, I think that's the one thing we have to offer, that they're not getting online. And some guys that have gone digital have come back and been like, I really like to come in here. I could talk with other people. You guys understand me. Yeah. And that's one of our key services that we provide is being able to relate and understand because it's kind of like going to see a movie by yourself. As soon as the, you're done, you're, you want to tell someone like, that Godzilla film was amazing. Yeah. This is probably yeah. the best yeah. I've ever seen. If yeah. no one's there next to you, it's kind of like, uh, okay. You know, I've said, I've said for a lot of years that comic stores, we are the bartenders to the nerd sect. Mm -hmm. and, and we're probably that because we're part of that community. You know? And we we do care about who's stronger, the thing or the Hulk. We do care that your 12th level paladin got eaten by a dragon in your last session. I'm sorry. You know, uh, we actually we actually have these conversations because we're the place where you can come and have those discussions. So that's what we offer in this community. That's that's a great note to end on. Great note to end on, guys. Thanks for taking the time. You know, I know I know you're all really busy. You know, and and I just think I don't know. I think this should be a regular thing. You know, like I think retail is as instrumental in this as publisher or anybody else. You know, it's it's so weird that the retailers almost never have a voice. And as soon as somebody does say something, they get mobbed. You know, if they say something that doesn't fit the narrative and so on. I hate it. I I couldn't stand back and watch Glenn O'Leary get trashed last week. It was horrific. You know. So like, I don't know, maybe we should do this more often. You know? well, Get it. Yeah. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for the time, Mark. All the best. Yeah, guys. thank you for yeah, thank you for letting us have a voice in this. Pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you.